Fleur Hassan Nahum is waiting. She's the Israeli Foreign Ministry Special Envoy and, of course, former Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, good morning to you, Fleur. Hi, Julia. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Just tell us, I mean, your experience, first of all, of events last night where we saw uh, these so 180 to 200 missiles attacking across uh, Israel from Iran, uh, uh, some aimed at Tel Aviv, some at Jerusalem, uh, where you are. Uh, tell us what you made of it. Well, it was a little bit faster than the last time, I have to say. I don't know whether we got spoiled on April when we were given five, six hours notice that there were missiles on the way to Israel, and then we we, did, we expected something similar. But I, I was actually doing an interview last night on TV when my phone buzzed uh, that there was a siren, and we all rushed into our shelter, myself, my husband, and our children and the dog. And we had to stay there for over an hour as uh, over 180 missiles, ballistic missiles, fell on the country. I mean, this, if we didn't have the technology of a, of a defense system that we've invested in for so many years, this would be, you know, it, the country would be practically destroyed right now. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? The Iron Dome has uh, worked spectacularly, as it did back in April. Um, despite the cheers on the streets of uh, supporters, you know, Palestinians and Iranians, uh, yesterday, we saw zero Israelis die. There have been some injuries, sadly. One Palestinian uh, hit by a rocket that was intercepted that fell to the ground, uh, and five Iranians interestingly, on their own territory, are dying. So not, not at all a success. We're told by your Prime Minister, uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, that Iran has made a big mistake and that they will pay. What does he mean by that? Well, ultimately, if any normal country would consider this a declaration of war. I don't see how any normal country protecting its territorial sovereignty can put up with something like this coming from a separate country, not even a bordering country. Um, and so something has to be done. But you have to remember, Julia, that they are responsible for everything. If we are looking at the axis of evil today, it is the Islamic Republic of Iran. They are funding, supporting, they created Hezbollah that has been Israel's enemy for so many years. We have 70,000 displaced people because on the 8th of October, Hezbollah decided to attack Israel. Hezbollah have destroyed Lebanon. Hezbollah were part of the Syrian, um, the Syrian civil war, and they killed and tortured so many Syrians. And Hezbollah is an arm of Iran. Hamas, the same thing. They're an arm of Iran. The Houthis that have killed British and American service people, and now they've got their noses in Iraq, uh, where they're in the government and they've created Shia militias. So what we see is a very clear strategy that the Islamic Republic of Iran has of taking over the Middle East. And uh, Israel is its first stop. Now, and it, we have to stop Iran because Iran with a nuclear weapon is an existential threat to us, but to the whole civilized and free world. Whatever the rights and wrongs of this, and you know, I've made very clear where, where, which, which side I come down on, I don't work for the BBC, I'm allowed to give my opinion. <laughs> I want to ask you, though, well, I mean, what did... Israel expect, regardless again of the rights and wrongs, the morality on whose side it was. If Israel takes out Hamas, takes out Hamas leaders, takes out uh, Hezbollah leaders, takes out uh, with the exploding pages and uh, and exposing walking talkies, uh, hundreds, possibly thousands of uh, Hezbollah militants, um, takes out senior figures in the IRGC and the Iranian Guard, shows you know invades takes you know, invades the, the the legitimate territory of 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 Lebanon it was completely obvious there would be retaliation from Iran was that expected has that been um was 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 it something that was Israel was prepared for and prepared for the expansion of the 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 the, the war in the Middle East well, that's a fair question, but you have to understand that Iran's strategy up until April has been to arm and push its proxies, but not to get their hands dirty. You know, there's a dark joke that says Iran will fight Israel to the last Arab. As you know, they're not Arabs, they're Persians. And so they don't mind sacrificing not Sunni lives and not Arab lives for their own evil ambitions in the region and in the world. Look, I don't know whether we expect, we certainly expected an attack from Iran. They've been talking about it since August. You have this kind of fake argument within Iran between their so-called moderate new president and the supreme leader. He's saying, let's be careful. 
It's clear that Iran don't want a regional war. That's clear. But the reason they don't want a regional war is because they know that in a regional war, we will disarm them and their nuclear ambitions. But just think about this. Just think about Hitler with a nuclear weapon. And this is what we're looking at in terms of Iran. Well, we've had They're a caller to... earlier saying that Benjamin Netanyahu wants a regional war, that this is what he wanted. Well, the last time I checked, it wasn't Benjamin Netanyahu that attacked, uh, Israel, attacked any other country on October 7th. We are at war for almost a year. We've had thousands of people killed and injured. We still have 101 hostages. If they want this all to be over, it's very simple. The Hezbollah have to go behind the Litani River and just comply with UN Resolution 1701, which the whole world has completely ignored for the last 18 years, why they've been attacking us and they've been rearming and they've been in contravention of UN Resolution 1701. You return our hostages. It can all be over by tomorrow. That's all they have to do. But, so why isn't it that they want to finish this? But this is the interesting thing where people say they want peace. Again, we, we know that is a simple solution, certainly in terms of the return of the hostages. There's no doubt at all, though, that there's been a lot of pressure on Benjamin Netanyahu. He's not a particularly popular figure within Israel, as you know. He's had to move to the sort of, sort of very right-wing uh, of, 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 uh, parties in his cabinet to maintain power. Um, that he was under a lot of pressure, particularly from hostages' families, to you know to try and come to some sort of ceasefire deal with Hamas uh, to get their their family members home, those who are still alive. We don't know how many of them are. Um, and then actually, this you know this audacious attack with pages and with rockets, um, the actions uh, into Lebanon that that has actually shored up. Benjamin Netanyahu to a certain extent, particularly ahead of the anniversary of the horrific massacre on October the 7th on Monday. Is there an element where the timing of all this is actually more political than strategic? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I'm friendly with one of the hostage families who, unfortunately, their son was brutally murdered in a tunnel. And if my child was in there, then I would be as, as critical of everyone as possible. Likewise. And this is yeah. why we live in a free democracy where people can protest and people can complain about their governments, which our neighbours do not have that privilege. And so I'm not going to sit in judgment of the hostage families. And I'm no uh, expert in national security, but I can tell you this. When an opportunity arises to kill an arch terrorist and an arch enemy and these opportunities are rare these opportunities are things that have to be made decisions in minutes we have to learn that sometimes the only way to get rid of the enemy is to actually kill them no, I'm, I'm, I'm all in favor I, I've been cheering I've been cheering on the death of every single uh, terrorist and uh, terrorist commander I think the world is a better place as a result uh, the questions have got a lot of critics who don't seem to think that just final question to you been critical of the BBC last night and today in terms of their coverage uh, they are our national broadcaster they broadcast around the world They're highly influential in the Middle East as a source of people believe neutral news what do you make of the BBC's uh, coverage of this conflict so far well, there's two reports that have shown that they are systematically biased in their words, in uh, the people that they have on their shows. They hide uh, the interests and the sources of the people who are commentating. Like, for example, they had somebody masters a journalist who's, uh, who's actually part of the PFLP. They wouldn't say that, of course. So they're being dishonest. They're being biased. It, if you ask me, they're being anti-Semitic. They won't call Hamas and Hezbollah terrorists. So I honestly don't know why people in the UK have to pay their license fees for basically, uh, we thought Al Jazeera was bad and I renamed them Goebbels TV. Well, it's been proven now, it's been proven by data that the BBC, especially BBC Arabic, is exactly as bad as Al Jazeera. So shame on them and shame on the UK government not either reining them in or letting people choose not to pay their TV licenses for them. Flo Hassan Nahum, Israeli Foreign Minister, special voice. Thank you very much indeed for that. Speaking to us live from Jerusalem. Um